Hello, hello everyone. Good morning to you all. I am Brunda Vishwanathan from Safe CRNTS IIT Bombay. For the last several years, I take care of uh, EPR facility over here. On behalf of Safe CRNTS, I extend a warm welcome to you for this webinar on EPR spectroscopy. This talk is going to be for about an hour or so. I have taken note of some of the responses that have come during the registration. We'll try to address them to the extent possible. And anyway, there is going to be a question and session towards the end. So there again, we can take up some of the issues. Before proceeding with the talk, I would like to give a brief introduction of our center that is SAVE. This is Sophisticated Analytical Instruments Facility. So SAFE is a part of a bigger center known as CRNTS, that is Center for Research in Nanotechnology and Science. So this is the front entrance of our building. So on the top you can see SAIF and then that CRNTS uh, is there. So this is inaugurated in the year 1978. Towards uh, sometime in 2008 or so, this uh, SAFE is merged with the CRNTS. So SAFE is fully supported from DST, that is Department of Science and Technology. We have around 16 major facilities in SAFE. And in CRNTS, another five major equipments are there. So total about 21 or so. So these are some of the facilities that we are having in uh, SAFE. So around 16 are listed here, out of which this 8 and 9, that is uh, EPR, electron spin resonance or uh, electron paramagnetic resonance spectrometer. So the one which is the new one is our GEOL model. We also have an old model, that is a variant model. It was installed in some time in 1980 or so, but that also is working fine. The only disadvantage or limitation is one cannot have a soft copy of the output. So otherwise that also is working fine. So this is listed in our site also. These are the another six uh, major facilities in that uh, CRNTS, coming under CRNTS. So essentially this is for the internal users, but we do accept samples from outside. So some of the things are ICP, AES, LRS, ESCM, GCGC, TOF-MS, and atom probe tomography. This is our EPR spectrometer GEOL model that is there in the lab. So what is seen in blue color is our UV attachment. So this is our site, SAIF, Sophisticated Analytical Instrument Facility. It is a regularly updated site, thanks to our tech team, our IT team. In the last few months, we have updated quite a few things and uh, things are made simpler from the user point of view. Submission of MSDS payment part, and then document uh, registration, all are made simpler now. Okay, so this is our safe uh, website, safe.iitb.ac.in. Now, we are getting samples from all across India. Not only to the Western zone we cater, we are getting samples from all over India. So these are some of the states that uh, we get. And uh, this slide, uh, you know, many, we do encourage visitors from various places. So somebody from, you know, that uh, executive society, Japan, and then uh, several teachers from UGC refresher course visited our center sometime in 2019. And uh, the third slide shows uh, demo session. We do take them around in our, uh, at our center. And the last one is some Tamil Nadu Agricultural University visitors. So this is our LinkedIn link. We are there in LinkedIn also. 
we have a youtube channel that is what is seen here so even this talk also will be kept recorded in the youtube and will be available for future viewing so this is a photograph taken of all our staff members okay so this is all about our uh, safe now let us uh, welcome our uh, speaker professor datta so i shall say a few words about him initially professor datta is a young and dynamic faculty from chemistry department iit bombay he joined here in fact his association started long back during his student days he did his msc from iit bombay Uh, after completing his graduation in 2005 from presidency college calcutta and then after completing his post graduation here in the year 2007 he went for his uh, doctoral degree and completed from arizona state university in 2012 then his post doctoral research was in the pacific northwest national laboratory usa from 2012 to 2015 afterwards he joined as assistant professor in iit gandhinagar so he continued there for 5 years and then last year he came back to his mentor institute that is iit bombay and joined here as assistant professor in our chemistry department still he is continuing now his sister, now to say something on his research interest he is into bio inspired catalyst designers in his lab they develop molecular catalysts that can perform small molecule activation reaction such as hydrogen evolution reaction then oxidation uh, reduction reaction and water oxidation reaction under the most practical conditions so now maybe he will uh, take up all his uh, research work during the talk so now let's welcome him let's go over to our speaker professor anmab datta so good morning all and thank you brinda ma'am for this nice introduction yes. and today what we are going to do we are going to take a journey about paramagnetic materials and how we can learn about the unpaired electrons through this unique spectroscopy called epr but before i go there i would like to first again thank uh, saif and crnts for this nice opportunity to discuss about the epr which will obviously brush my knowledge about epr and uh, specifically ms brinda and professor anil for their support and i would specially like to mention uh, professor gautam lahiri who is uh, my mentor during my student days and from whom i learned the basics of epr who is a legendary researcher in the field of epr spectroscopy and even today i am going to lend some of his knowledge and even some of his slides and figures during this particular talk so special thanks to professor lahiri so this is the outline what we are actually going to follow today so first we'll introduce a little bit about the history and the background of epr then we'll talk about the basic parameters that we are going to use to understand the unpaired the unpaired electron properties and there are several parameters and we are specifically going to look into the details of two parameters one is the g factor and one is the hyperfine splitting constant a and then if time permits we will going to look into some of the applications using these parameters and understand how the epr can let us know about the molecular structure so first with the introduction so as we are saying from the beginning that epr is about the unpaired electrons if you have one or more unpaired electrons they actually have this unique property of paramagnetism and if you put that in the presence of an external magnetic field they actually behave totally differently and this behavior is different from different molecule depending on how the unpaired electron is connected with the molecule so by that we can actually scan through the different magnetic fields and understand how the electron is actually behaving and from there we can try to understand because electron is not going to sitting on its own it is sitting in a molecule and from there we try to gauge some of the properties of the molecule itself now if you think about where we get the unpaired electrons 
if we sit back and think, we are actually living in an atmosphere which actually contains around 21% of oxygen. And oxygen has unpaired electrons, two of them. So at least one fifth of the atmosphere we are dealing with already contain paramagnetic materials. And oxygen as a, <coughs> a reactive material, it reacts with a lot of things and creates paramagnetic intermediate through the wave. And those can be seen in organic systems, in inorganic systems known as free radicals. And these free radicals actually give us an idea how our atmosphere, our biology, and even the materials world actually interacting. We also have the transition metal complexes, which also contain a huge portion of the behavior which we can follow through this particular spectroscope. Now, we call this spectroscopy in three different names, electron paramagnetic resonance or EPR, electron spin resonance or ESR, and electron magnetic resonance or EMR. And all of the, them are actually going to say about the same thing in three different perspectives. So for the sake of the simplicity, I'm going to stick with EPR for this particular talk. So if you find something called ESR and EMR, it is nothing but very similar to what we are calling EPR today. So now why this EPR is important? As we are discussing, oxygen is all around our place and we also can detect and generate different free radicals during photochemical and chemical reaction, which is coming throughout all the anthropogenic systems we are actually taking all around the world. And through that, we can develop a huge amount of materials or particulate molecules which are actually paramagnetically active. And those are actually affect too much on our environment through the pollution. So that's why pollution control and environmental science have a huge role to play through this EPR, where we can detect all this environmentally persistent free radicals or it, as it is known as EPFR. In biology, <clears throat> especially the dynamics of the protein is a huge thing that we always try to understand. And NMR is a big tool for that. And in parallel, EPR can also help that because it can act as an internal probe to understand how the protein is behaving even inside a live cell. And over there, I'm showing you a picture of alpha synuclein, which is connected to some of the neurodegenerative diseases where the folding of the protein is very crucial. We can look into the material science, especially energy research, where we can learn about the structure of the batteries, also from EPR. And as we are saying, the biology is very much closely connected with oxygen and all the other free radicals we are generating all the time. So EPR can be a technique to understand what is the amount of free radicals present in the food or in the soil, and we can go through the quality control of either of those things in our day-to-day -day life. So that's why EPR is quite omnipresent in our life, even if we don't realize it properly. So now I will take you a little bit on the history lane when we first came to know about this interesting spectroscopy called EPR. The first EPR resonance phenomena is actually observed by a Russian scientist known as Evgeny Konstantinovich Javoyevsky. So very interestingly, a little bit of detour and giving a short story about Javoyevsky. So around 1940s, he was working at that moment to see what is the effect of magnetic field, external magnetic field on the NMR system, on a proton system. And he was one of the first people to even observe the NMR signals. But in 1941, the World War II break and he has to stop his work for almost two years. And by that time, he also lost some of his instrument. So then after almost two years, 1943, he resumed his work. And by that time, he was a little bit far in the NMR study. And then he started looking, can we also look the effect of paramagnets in place of a proton in the presence of an external magnetic field? And he was able to see it that over there, it is one of the oldest data he actually actually accumulated, where they actually looked into a presence of manganese salt in a methanol, and he varied the magnetic field and his orientation. He found 
depending on the direction, the magnetic moment changes. And this is the instrument he used and he established the EPR. But as it happens for most of the huge discoveries, most of the people at that time don't even believe him. So he has to go to Moscow because at the time when he was working, it was in Kazan University. He has to go to Moscow and he has to develop this instrument from the scratch in front of the other scientists to prove that is actually a real phenomena, not a, something uh, coming from the instrument itself. And then he was actually nominated for Nobel Prize almost 17 times. And unfortunately, he didn't get the prize. But today we recognize his contribution to this EPR spectroscopic field. And in 1997, a lab museum has been established in Kazan University and all his instrument, all his work has been actually preserved over there. So it is a very nice place to visit. And I would also like to take your attention for this particular article published in Resonance, uh, published by Indian Academy of Science, where his work and his contribution has been nicely depicted over there. So now we got our idea about EPR and why it is needed and who actually first started it. Now let's look into the details of it. So as we discussed that the, in EPR, what actually happens, the paramagnetic system or the unpaired electron is interacting with an external magnetic field. Why? Because the unpaired electron itself has a magnetic field. So that's why they have an interaction. Now the question is where this magnetic field is coming from for the unpaired electron. So that actually generates from two different motions. One is the orbital and one is the spin moment. We'll take one by one. First, the orbital magnetic moment. So over here, I am going to show you some physical phenomena of what is happening. We'll show some equations, but I'll go slow step by step so that we can follow it properly. So over here, what I'm showing the orbital moment. So in a classical moment, what we can say that an electron is moving around an orbit over here. It is a charged molecule. So when it is moving like that, it is creating a charged loop. And once it creates a charged loop, according to the electrodynamic theory, it is going to produce a magnetic moment perpendicular to that plane of its motion. So if I want to understand what is this magnetic moment and what is its strength, I need to understand what is the electrical field first. So now I am also showing you that this electron, when it is moving around, it has the angular velocity of omega. So from there, I can say, that how many times the electron is revolving around this particular orbit, this particular plate-like orbit. So it is going to be omega by 2 pi from the definition of angular velocity because it is given in the pi radian. Then if it is moving around omega by 2 pi times per second, how much current it is carrying? It is the same amount of revolution it is making into the charge of the electron, which is given by E. So in the electromagnetic unit, it will be E omega by two pi C. The C is the velocity of light. That parameter also comes over here. So this is the amount of charge it is carrying in this system when the electron is moving around with a angular velocity of omega. That is very nice. Now, can I say what will be the magnetic field? Yes, I can. The orbital magnetic moment, or as I'm writing as mu L, L stands for orbital motion. It will be the strength of the current that we just measured into the area of the orbit, how much area it is covering. So it will be E omega 2 pi C, that is the strength of the current and the area, considering it as a circular area, it will be pi R square, R is the <coughs> radius of the motion. So that will be E omega R square by 2 C. So now we have the orbital magnetic moment. But you can see it is not a very easy parameter to follow up because if I want to find out what is the orbital magnetic moment so that I can find out how it is going to interact with the external field, this is not a very easy parameter or easy system to follow because they have some parameters that will be very tough to understand, omega, r, all those things. So can we find the same orbital angular momentum in the form of some simple quantum numbers? And why it will be important and why we're going to that? That is because this equation will be simplified. 
make our life simple. That is number one goal. And secondly, if I can connect this orbital magnetic moment with some quantum numbers, because the quantum numbers is showing you something about the structure of the atom or the molecule, we can connect this orbital magnetic moment to some of the molecular properties. So that's why our goal is to now connect this orbital magnetic moment to a simple quantum number. How to do that? So already we know from our little bit of quantum chemistry idea that orbital angular momentum for this same system is given by m omega r squared. It can be defined in the terms of the quantum number root over l into l plus 1 into h by 2 pi. That is the orbital angular momentum if the electron moving in the orbit which has a quantum number of l. l is the orbital quantum number. So nice. So now I can represent the orbital angular momentum m omega r square in the terms of quantum numbers. Can I replace this e omega r square by 2c also by this? I can. So what I'm going to do, I'm just rearranging the system. So go slowly. Orbital angular momentum, we know it is e omega r square by 2c. I am rearranging that so that I can generate this m omega r square term so that I can replace that with this root over L into L plus 1 h by 2 pi. I did that, but to do that, I have to introduce an m. So I have to divide that and the e by 2c is already existing. So I have to also take care of that. And then I can put this whole equation in the term of a quantum number root over L into L plus 1. But over here, there's another term connected to it. It is e h by 4 pi mc. And what is e? It is the charge of electron. h is the Planck's constant and the other m is the mass of the electron. So you can see all these things over here. When I'm representing orbital angular moment in terms of a quantum number, other than the quantum number, all the terms over here, e h by 4 pi mc, it is a, a unique property for the electron itself because h, pi, c are universal constant and e, r, m are constant for a particular electron. And that particular term is termed as beta, which is known as the Bohr magneton. So it is a constant for an electron. So it is nothing but a constant into some quantum numbers. And now we have a very simple representation of orbital magnetic moment. Cool, so orbital magnetic moment is taken care of. Now, if we look very closely, we can found that this orbital angular momentum is also defined by quantum numbers. Magnetic moment is also defined by quantum numbers and they are very similar. But if I take a ratio of them, magnetic moment divided by angular momentum, this, orbit, uh, this orbital quantum numbers cancels out, but there is some term stays E by 2mc, which is also a constant. And that is known as the gyromagnetic ratio. That means how much of the angular momentum is transformed into a magnetic moment. So that means the charged particle is moving, that is its momentum, how much it is actually transformed into the magnetic moment. This is known as the gyromagnetic ratio. And that is constant for an electron moving in an orbit. That is very important because then when we go to the second term, the spin magnetic moment, that actually comes very handy. Why? Because orbital magnetic moment, we actually start our thinking how the electron is moving around an orbit. We have a classical picture, we can understand it. But understanding spin is not that straightforward. Although in some places it is said that you just ensure that the electron is nothing but moving around itself. It is possible when you are considering electron as a particle, but electron is mostly showing a character of a wave when you're considering this particular characters. So you cannot consider a wave is moving around itself either. So that's why how to think about the spin. Spin is nothing but a totally integral part of the electrons itself. What do I mean by integral part? So now if I say you the electron has a charge of E, you just say, okay, the electron is there and it has a charge of this particular amount, say E. We don't actually think too much about how the charge is behaving, how the charge is spreading around. We just say, if the electron is there, there will be this amount of charge E, there will be this amount of mass M, and so on and so forth. This is an integral part. It comes with it. You cannot change it. Similarly, the spin of an electron is also an integral part. It comes with a spin of half, no matter what, no matter where you take the electron, in around the galaxy. Always it will have the same mass E, same uh, charge E, same mass M, and the same spin, spin equal to half. And then it is not a very easy way to say that the electron is moving around itself. It is an integral part, it comes on itself. 
So if that is the case, how I can find the spin magnetic moment? That we can found again because we can actually measure the spin angular momentum because because of the presence of the spin, it also has an angular momentum and the ratio of the spin magnetic moment that we can measure and spin angular momentum that we also can measure. It is E by MC. Now, if we compare that the same thing for the orbital motion, you see they are very similar. The only thing there is an extra two over there in orbital motion that is not here in the spin. That means if you try to explain it physically, the moment, the angular momentum transfer into the magnetic moment, it is almost twice from during the spin compared to the orbital motion. So that means in the spin, almost twice amount of angular momentum is transferred in the form of the magnetic moment. So using this equation, I can find out the magnetic moment. So spin angular moment into E by MC, which is again twice than the term of the gyrometric ratio for the orbital moment. Now over here, the spin angular momentum that we can measure with respect to again, a quantum number, the spin quantum number. This is root over S into S plus one H by two pi, again multiplied by E by MC, that is the ratio. If we put it together, it is becoming root over S into S plus one EH by two pi MC. Now you can see that this term is not exactly same what we achieve in the term of orbitals. It was EH by four pi MC. So I want to keep that constant same. So I put it four over there. Then I have to multiply by two to balance this equation. So that is over here. I can replace this as again the Bohr magnetic term beta. So over here I can do that, but this extra term two comes over here. Why? Because of the difference in the gyrometric ratio of the spin and orbital motion. And then if I write this equation, the so orbital magnetic moment is mu l into root over l into l plus one beta. The spin magnetic moment is 2 into root over s into s plus 1 into beta. So over there you can see the moment are such that the magnetic moment is nothing but their angular momentum into this term beta and with a term g over here which is 1 for orbital angular momentum and 2 for spin angular momentum or magnetic moment. So this term is known as the g factor or spectroscopic splitting factor which has the root in the gyrometric ratio, how much of the angular momentum I can transfer into a magnetic moment. That is the term coming over here. And that is one for orbital moment and two for spin moment. So over here, still now we are considering the orbital and spin magnetic moment differently. What happens if both of them are active? If both of them are active, then we are going to have a magnetic moment of mu, which will be a connection between the orbital and spin magnetic moment, which is given over there. L and G into S. G is again the factor. L I am not writing because it is one for spin value, it is two. And if I split it totally, that is the overall value. So over here, if a spin and orbital moments are quite strong, they are going to produce each of their own spin moment and they are going to balance it together. And how they couple together? For that, we have already learned there is a particular facilities are there to understand that and those are known as LS coupling or Russell Sanders coupling. And over there, when you do that, the L and S actually combine together to give me another term known as total angular momentum quantum number or J. And at that moment, the G value also changes because now it is going to be coupled between the L and the S value for the G and that is given as gj and this is the full equation comes in. That is when we are considering the L value, that means the orbital moment exists, spin moment exists, and both of them are coupling very strongly. However, if we look into this particular equation where there are j values are there, s values are there, L values are there, if I consider a system where there is no orbital momentum present, that means L is, is equal to zero at that term, and if I have only one electron, that means spin equal to half. So from this system, I'm going to simplify it the most simple equation possible. Only one electron, no orbital motion. So spin equal to half because that is the integral motion. L is equal to zero and J will be either L plus S or L minus S over L is not present. So it will be equal to S is equal to half. So S equal to J, L is not existent and our G value 
if you put all the system over here, J is equal to S, L is cancelled, you will get this value 2, which is nothing but the G value for the spin itself. So it shows that this G value, it is connected with the spin and orbital angular momentum, but it can transform into totally the spin value when there is no orbital moment present. And that is here comes the term free electron. We use this term free electron quite often, <clears throat> and we generally say that the electron is moving on its own. That is specifically not correct, because if we look through these calculations, what we say, a free electron is there only when we can say one unpaired electron is equal to half, and L is equal to zero. That means no orbital contribution. That means the electron is not present in such an orbital where it is degenerate to other orbitals, where the electron can share between other orbitals and create an orbital motion. No, electron is just com confined into one particular orbital. That means it is a non-degenerate orbital. And secondly, the spin is equal to half. That means it cannot change its spin state. That means it cannot go to a different excited state. So that means it is a very stable ground state and it is a non-degenerated orbital so that it cannot generate any more orbital motion. And that is giving me the G value for a free electron, which should be equal to two, but actually it comes to 2.0023 because of the relativistic correction, because this electron and its spin are actually quantum phenomena. So that is the value of G, and that is what a free electron is. Now, how this free electron is going to interact with an external magnetic field? So far, we understand how magnetic field is generated in an electron. It is a spin on an orbit. <clears throat> so far, we are again making the simple system. We are considering a free electron. That means <clears throat> no orbital motion, only the spin, one electron, half. And how it is going to interact when I put an external magnetic field, H over here. So what is going to happen before we put the magnetic field? This spin is going to create a spin moment of root over S into S plus one into beta value, and that is going to move around in any particular direction. But once I put the magnetic field, external magnetic field, it cannot move anywhere. It have to move to a particular direction in a particular place because of the interaction between the H and the spin moment mu s. And it's such a way that anywhere in the world you put the magnetic field, it is going to precess around it and make a cone-like shape like that. So this is the magnetic moment. It is going to be rotating around the magnetic field and is going to create a cone-like shape like this. It can be either along with the magnetic field or opposite to the magnetic field. So the two cones. So what is the interesting factor about that cause? So over here, when you're looking into, this is the spin magnetic moment. It has a value of root over S into S plus one into H by two pi. That is the angular momentum that is value is coming from. And it actually always create a particular angle with this magnetic field such that the projection, projection of this magnetic moment on the H, that means the axis where I'm putting my magnetic field is always going to be half into H by two pi. So over here, A is equal to half. So it is root over three by four actually, but it is going to project only half into H by two pi, no matter what, whatever the magnetic field you put. It always going to be putting this particular projection over there. If it is along with the axis, it is plus half. If it can also be opposite direction, but it also project minus half. Plus and minus is just showing you the direction. Half is the magnitude of this. So these two magnitudes are actually same. One is along with the H, one is against the H. And this particular phenomena creates, there are two different states possible when I put the magnetic field. And those are known as the MS or magnetic spin quantum number. So spin quantum number is S equal to half. When I put the magnetic field, only then it can orient in these two different direction when it's precessing in such a way that is creating a projection of half or minus half. And then I can find out what is the energy. And what is the energy? It is the mu into H. H is the magnetic field we produce and mu is the projection. This value we are talking about 
along in the direction of h and what is that mu n it is nothing but half into g into beta so this ms value is nothing but can be plus half or minus half depending on whether it is along and against the system so that means the energy will be minus mu into h minus sign is coming originally mu is the magnetic moment along with the projection of the h value that is the external magnetic field i am putting and the strength of the magnetic field so that is going to give me this term g into ms into beta into h and ms value can be either plus half or minus half now let's take a look which one will be the lower energy i already give you the hint it is the minus half why it is minus half because over there in this term there are actually three negative term one is the originally the minus term then there is a minus half so they will multiply together it will be a plus term but there is also this beta term what is beta beta is nothing but as we just called last time eh by 4 pi mc you can see all the terms are constant e is the charge of the electron which is negative so that makes this bohr magnet and the beta value also negative and that's why over there the beta term is also negative so there are three negative terms beta is negative minus half is negative and minus term is also there so all they multiply together and give me a negative energy of minus g beta h into half when i am considering minus half state when i am considering plus half state there is only two negative the minus half term and the beta term so it will be plus half into g beta h so that's why all together the ms equal to minus half system becomes a ground state and <clears throat> half equal becomes a ground state and we can find out the energy of each of them individually it is minus half g beta h it is plus half g beta h so that's nice i can now know how the spin is interacting in presence of magnetic field i know the energy term between them and they will spread out they will split only in presence of magnetic field unless i put the magnetic field they cannot precess they cannot split in these two states so now what is the energy difference between them very easy just subtract them out and if you subtract them out we found it is nothing but g beta h and now you can see that is nothing but a g term which is again connecting to the unique property of the electron to the gyromagnetic ratio beta is a constant h is the magnetic field i am putting in so now we will go into little bit details what is the significance of this equation delta e is equal to g beta h so first of all when we look into this equation we can see the g term is something unique to the molecule i cannot change for this unpaired electron beta is also a constant the only thing i can change is h if i change the h the delta e that separation will change if i increase the h the separation will increase and that is shown over here if i change the magnetic field over here from 3000 to 35000 gauss gauss is a unit of magnetic field you can say the separation increases as it is given by this particular equation and depending on how much magnetic field i am using there are four different instruments has been developed so far known as x band k band q band and w band and this is the magnetic field in gauss given for this each particular bands when i look into this equation delta e equal to g beta h so i know with respect to magnetic field how much i am separating but this also says that i can also create a resonating condition i can give a particular electromagnetic radiation so that i can transfer some of this minus half state to plus half state considering we have a difference in population between minus half and plus half and in general the delta e value in such a condition that there are some population difference how i can make them similar by putting some electromagnetic radiation and this electromagnetic radiation depending on the h value actually falls in the region of microwave just to give you a corollary the same thing for protons during nmr falls in the radio frequency range so it is at least 10 to the power 5 to 10 to the power 6 times more high in energy in epr compared to the nmr so it falls in the microwave region so that means this energy gap i can also satisfy equation e using different versions of microwave frequency so those are given over there with respect to the unit gigahertz that means 10 to the power 9 into hertz hertz is per second unit for x band again it is 9 megahertz similarly k24 q25 and w band is the 90 megahertz gigahertz machine 
So now the term comes over here. That is very nice. We can reciprocate that uh, system with either electromagnetic radiation or the magnetic field. But what does it say about the system? So now here comes a unique thing. This G value for an electron, for a free electron, we know it is constant, G equal to 2.0023. So that means whatever the magnetic field I'm putting, if the G value becomes constant, I know exactly what is the delta E, and I know exactly where it will resonate with respect to the frequency I'm giving. So for a free electron, if I'm putting a magnetic field A0, and the corresponding value for the frequency is mu zero. So I can write this equation. This is for a free electron. But in reality, the G value is not always 2.0023. And that is a good thing. Otherwise, we will not spending time of understanding EPR if the value is always 2.0023. It is not because the unpaired electron actually experience the difference around the chemical environment it is having. And depending on that, the G value shifts a little bit from a free electron. How it is changing will come into a little bit later, but it changes. And due to this slight changes in the G value, this G value is not same as GE. So if I use the same frequency H nu, I cannot, again, I cannot give the resonating condition with the same H zero value. I have to change it so that it matches it. Because over here, I am changing the G, so I have to also change the H dash in a such a recipro uh, and anti reciprocal manner so that it matches this frequency. And from there, I can say a slightly changed G value will be equal to a free electron GE, the magnetic field required for the free electron resonance, and the magnetic field required for this particular field resonance. And that is why a very important thing that the G value can reflect the chemical surrounding of the nature. So what that says, not says that it is not only going to show me how it is different, but it can also show how it is anisotropic. Anisotropic means how it is changing in all different directions. So for an example over here, I am showing you not the electron density, but the spread of the G value around an electron. Over there, it is a sphere. That means it is equal all along the X, Y, and Z axis. This is always possible. That means there is no anisotropy in the system and it is called the isotropic. That means the electron actually shares a, system, a coordination system such a way that all the directions are pretty much same. However, it can be such a way that the X and Y is similar, but it is different than Z. So it can have these two conditions where either the GX and GY value is less than G value or greater than G value. So these two different axial orientations are possible for the G value. Or it can also be possible that G value is totally different in all different axes. This is known as rhombic. So these systems are again not the electrons <coughs> contribution, but it is the spread of the G value, how it is seeing its surrounding. If it is totally symmetric, it is symmetric in the X and Y, but different in Z, or it is asymmetric all around X, Y, Z. So depending on that, this value will be changing at a constant nu zero. And how it is going to show is respect of, of the absorbance. In the case of isotropic, there will be one sharp signal because X, Y, Z, no matter what, which direction you polarize, you are going to see the same system. For the axial system, you are going to see two bands. And depending on where is my X and Y and Z, Z value slides, this can either have this particular orientation or it can have this G, X, G, Y, G, Z totally different. And over here, you can see I'm showing you that the G value can be different. It can be very slightly different. And depending on the spread or the width of the absorbance phenomena we are seeing over here, that can be very easy to understand whether I have a shoulder or not, whether I have a peak or not. So that's why, in general, we actually represent the EPR data not in the absorbance as it is done in NMR or optical absorbance, but in its first derivative. Why? Because in first derivative, I can exactly know where my peak is. Because if there is an absorbance phenomenon like this, if I take the first derivative, it is going to cross zero value at a particular magnetic field, and I can exactly know where my G value is. So that is very easy to understand from here. But if you have this kind of spread over there and you have a 
peak over there that is going to show a peak like that so from there i can have value of the g values and over there the main peak where it is crossing the zero that will be the g value if it has three peaks the maxima and minima are the two values and where it is crossing the g h it is the other g value so that is how we are going to look into it now when you are talking about that how we actually run this experiment we actually show that the energy value you can control by two things either with the magnetic field or with the frequency you are showing it over there now either you can do two things first hold the magnetic field constant and change the microwave frequency to see where it actually matches and resonates and you see a signal or you make your frequency constant and change the magnetic field and see where it actually matches in general uh, conditions or in typically it is actually the second one where we actually give a particular constant microwave frequency h nu and then we actually scan the magnetic field and then try to find out where it matches for an example i have a constant energy difference that i can get from the resonance of the h nu that is this line showing over here and then i start shifting the magnetic field as i increase the magnetic field this ms half or ms minus half is going to separate it how much depends on the age so as i'm increasing the age at one particular sweet time it is going to resonate i will get a signal if i go less magnetic field value the h nu zero is too high to resonate and if i go too high g value it is too small to resonate so at only one particular place i am going to see the speed so with this thing now i can go how the machine actually looks like so over there this is a source of a <coughs> microwave frequency which actually goes through this system to this cavity where my sample is there and here is the magnet and here is the modulator with which i change the magnetic field and try to change it such a way that this constant microwave frequency can absorb at one particular value and when it is absorbing i am actually detecting over here this is the actually how the machine looks like in graph and this is the, how the machine actually looks like in real life so this is the magnet here is your cavity this is the system where you actually generate the moment and nowadays they are actually putting that with the similar thing with the detector so now with that thing in mind now we go to the second important parameter hyperfine interaction so over here we are talking about the effect of magnetic field on the unpaired electron because it is magnetic those two magnetic moments interact but your nucleus can also have a magnetic moment and that can also interact so what happens when it start interacting so that we are going to consider taking the most simplest of system a proton which has a spin value of i equal to half a nuclear spin value of half which can also orient in two different orientations plus up or minus up in terms of magnetic field how it is going to interact before that i am going to again take a simple system of a free electron a spin of half in presence <clears throat> of a magnetic field it is creating plus up or minus up this is their energy minus up g beta h plus up g beta h energy differences g beta h that we just discussed now if i consider the magnetic field is also interacting with my nuclear motion that can also be plus up or minus up for each of this electron state because for each electron there is a nucleus of one proton that proton can orient against or for with the magnetic field and over here plus up state comes lower because how much they are going to split that depends on the magnetic field and the interaction between the electron and the magnetic nuclear magnetic spin which is given by this term a into ms into mi ms is the spin value of the electron plus up or minus up mi is also the nuclear magnetic spin value of the nucleus which is also in this case plus up and minus up and a is the parameter which shows that how much they are interacting higher value means it is interacting strongly lower value means it is interacting weakly and this term you can see it is devoid of any magnetic field so they will interact no matter what how much of magnetic field you are putting in and then this term is going to be contributed with this minus half or plus half g beta h term as a term of a into ms into mi so over here plus half and this is a minus half 
for the electron spin. So that's why minus 1 by 4 A, it comes lower in energy. Minus half, minus half, we say plus 1 by 4th energy, so on and so forth. Now, where the electrons will go through? Now, there are four states. The electron can pass through following the selection rule such a way that your spin value changes plus minus 1. That means it has to go to minus half to plus half. And your nuclear spin value cannot change. So plus half to plus half or minus half to minus half. And you can see if I consider the electron differences, it can go to this A to D or B to C. And what is the energy difference? A to D is G beta H plus half A. And this small one, it is G beta H minus half A. So that means previously, before the interaction, this energy difference is G beta H shown over here. Now it's split into two lines and where they are coming, G beta H plus half A or minus half A. So these are the two lines. And what is the difference between these two lines? G beta H, G beta H will cancel. Half A minus minus half A, it is going to be A. So this one peak will split into two lines and the difference between the two lines will be the hyperfine splitting uh, interaction constant or hyperfine uh, uh, coupling constant known as A. And where is the G value? You can see this value is coming at such a way that it is treated in a regular difference of plus half a and minus half a. So their average will be the position where the G value would be if there is no hyperfine splitting constant and that is going to be the G value. So you consider the G values of each of the peaks, average it out, that will be the G value where there will be no hyperfine splitting constant is there. That means the original G value, okay? So that is how you find out the G and A value. So over here, I consider the simple most system of nuclear spin of half. <coughs> there are different systems like copper, which can have a nuclear spin value of three and a half. So that means each of the electron spin can split in four different states. And we can have four different <coughs> electron transfer, electron spin transfer, where keeping again the I value same, but changing only the MS value. So considering that, we are going to have four lines that we are going to see over here. And difference between each those lines, each those peaks is the A value. And where is the G value? Find out the peaks of this, average it out, that will be the G value. So over here, you can see the copper is showing me two different G values because it is an axial motion as we have discussed earlier. Why it is so? And why the value is coming over here, the splitting, but not over here, we are coming in a little bit of moment. But over here, what I'm going to show you that depending on the I value, it is going to split and how many lines it is going to split? It is nothing but two N I plus one. N is number of equivalent <coughs> nuclei I'm talking about. I is the spin nuclear spin value of the particular nuclei. So it is going to have two N I plus one line. For I equal to half, it is two. For I equal to three and a half, it is four lines over here. If you can have manganese where I equal to five by two, you can have six lines, if you have vanadium where I equal to seven by two, you can have eight lines and so on and so forth. So it is going to have a unique signature of which particular nuclei you are seeing and how much interaction you are seeing from the value of A and the splitting pattern of the A values. Now, we are going to go a little bit deep, deep into the G and A value, try to understand how it is going to say something about the structure of the molecule. And for that, we are going to use our favorite nuclei, copper. So copper system <coughs> has a D9 system over here in octahedral field, it says like that. One unpaired electron in this EG orbital. However, we know it automatically goes to gentler distortion so that it can stabilize. Now the gentler distortion can happen for the copper from the octahedral field in two different ways. Either it can have a Z out, that means the Z <coughs> axial ligands moves out and over, over here, the Z based orbital stabilize and the X based, X square minus Y square and X Y based orbital destabilizes. Or it can be opposite. The, it can get compressed and the Z values are actually getting destabilized. It goes higher in energy and X Y values get stabilized. Now the question is during a gentler distortion, which one is happening? Can I use EPR to understand which one of them is happening? It is Z out 
or Z in. To understand that, we have to now go through and try to have an idea how the G value changes. So as we have already discussed with you, an unpaired electron such as this present over here, it is not going to have a spin only value all the time. That means a G value of a free electron 2.0023, it will not be present all the time. It can be different. So why it is different? As we have discussed earlier, the overall moment, magnetic moment can occur not only for spin, but also from orbital angular momentum. That means if the orbital angular momentum kicks in, that is going to give a overall magnetic moment, which will be different from only spin only magnetic moment. So that means the G value connected to that will be different from free electron value or GE. So that means there should be a orbital momentum coming into a orbital contribution coming into. Now the how the orbital contribution comes into this place. <coughs> so now orbital motion comes when the electron is allowed to move to other orbitals. If it is sitting on its own, there is no particular difference of this electron moving to the other spaces and creating a orbital motion. So that means I have to move this electron to other spaces. How I can move it? As we know from degrees of freedom, I can do three different things. Translation, in translation, I'm not going to move to a different plane or system. Vibration, again, it is happening almost in the similar place and it averaged out very similar to what it is beginning with. And then comes rotation. If I rotate it, then I can bring that orbital to a totally different place. Giving you the example with the dx square minus y square orbital. This is my x, y, z plane I am considering. This is the x square minus y square orbital lying around the x and y axis. Now say along with the x axis I am rotating. So this is the x axis I am rotating this orbital. If I rotate it, what will happen? From the x, y plane, if I rotate along with this x plane 90 degree, this shaded ones will come in the plane of the yz. If I rotate around the x-axis, if I rotate it, now this will come into the yz frame from the xy. Just imagine a plate of xy rotating 90 degree. Now you have some contribution in the yz plane. And that is actually what's happening. You can rotate and transfer the electron density of x minus y squared in the same place where the yz orbital, dyz orbital lives. Similarly, for y-axis, if I rotate, again, consider a plate in the xy plane, rotate it. Now, you have some electron density in the xz plane. So that means rotating through the y-axis, I can go to the xz plane. What about z-axis? That is the easiest to understand. It is remaining in the xy plane, but not along with the axis, but somewhere in between the axis. That means dx square minus y square can transform into dxy. <coughs> so that is why through these three different rotation, <coughs> I can rotate the dx square minus y square orbital to either of these orbitals. Do I have to remember this all? Actually, no, because all these orbitals where they can rotate, these are already done because it's a mathematics and symmetry and they are way ahead of chemistry time. So over there, I'm showing how a dx square minus y square and dz square orbital can rotate along with the x, y, z plane. x square minus y square, I just discussed with you. <clears throat> now take a z square orbital and rotate along the x axis, it moves to the yz plane. If you move the z square orbital in the y axis, it goes to the xz plane. But imagine a dz square orbital and you are rotating along the z axis. A dz square orbital rotating along z axis, it is not going anywhere. It is remaining in the same place because dz square orbital, it is actually lying on the z axis. So that is why there will be no contribution for this axis. That means in the z-axis rotation or z-axis excitation, the dz square orbital will not contribute anything. Why this is important? Because through this interaction, which orbital it is going to change, I can find out how my g values can have different orientations or different values with respect to the free electron g value, ge, <clears throat> by using this equation. What is this equation? gi equal to ge, into one plus ni lambda divided by delta i. Now coming into the ni value. ni value is nothing but these values shown over here in front of the orbitals, minus i, minus i, two i, i root over three and all those values. i is the imaginary term. And if I have to take the square of those terms, that is going to be the value of my matrix term. 
Now, what is lambda? It is the spin orbit coupling constant because this movement is going to happen through an interaction with the spin and orbit motion. So higher is the coupling constant, higher is the possibility that I'm going to do this transformation. What is delta i? Come over here, this is the dx square minus y square orbital. And over here, if I rotate the z axis around z axis, I have an electronic interaction between the xy orbital and x square minus orbital. So this xy and x square minus orbital will interchange. And that will depend what is the energy gap between them. And that is nothing but this delta i. In case of x and y orbital, I can see the dx square minus y square for x axis rotation, it goes to yz. And for y axis rotation, it goes to xz. Now xz and yz are degenerate. So that's why x and y is going to be having the same energy. And also you can see they have the same matrix element. So altogether, what we are going to consider it, we are going to have the same value. So that means X and Y G value will be similar. So that is where the axial motion is going to come into picture. We'll come into that a little one slide later. Coming into the DZ square orbital, for the X moment, you are going to YZ. For the Y rotation, you're going to XZ. Again, they're similar in energy and they have similar values in front. Now, what happens for the Z axis rotation? That is not happening. So that's why there is no contribution. Now consider all these things and this particular equation. If I look into, I can find the dx square minus y square orbital. If it is like this electron per electron for a gx and gy, that means x and y rotation, I'm going to have the same value, ge minus two lambda and difference between the energy of xz, yz and x square minus y square orbital. It is going to have the same value. So that's why gx and gy is going to have the same value. What is going to be the GZ orbital? It is going to be the GE and this energy gap, which is written as, sorry, sorry it should be Z to ZZ, which is the energy gap between dx square minus y square and dxy. And there's a term eight lambda. Now over here, the lambda, the spin orbit coupling constant is actually negative value. If we have a more than half filled system like this copper system. And that's why this negative value of lambda and there's already negative value present over here, what will happen? This will become a positive term. That means you are going to see GX and GY and GZ value higher than the value of GE. So that means if unpaired electron stays in the X square minus Y square orbital, I am going to see all the GX, GY, GZ value higher than the value of GE. And not only that, over there, there is eight lambda for GZ and two lambda for GX and GY. That means the GZ value will be higher because it has a plus eight lambda because lambda is negative. And over here, it's only two delta lambda. Delta XY and delta ZZ is actually quite similar or even in this case, delta GZ is actually lower. So this is going to give you a higher value of GZ. So in this case, if the unpaired electron is in the X square minus Y square orbital, your GZ value will be higher than GX and GY. And yes, that will be higher than the GE or the unpaired electron. In case of dz square, where the unpaired electron is the dz square orbital, what is going to happen? It is going to show a gx and gy system like this, ge minus six times delta xy. gz is not going to show any contribution, so it will be similar to ge. And over here, again, lambda is negative, so it will add it up together. So my gx and gy value will be higher than gz, and gz value will be equal to ge. And over there, because Z axis is generally where we put our external magnetic field in, so we call them parallel, G parallel. And X and Y is perpendicular to that, so we call them G perpendicular. Now, all these things two together, so if the unpaired electron is in the DX square minus Y square orbital, what we found, the GZ or the G parallel will be higher in energy than the G perpendicular, and it will be higher than 2.0023. And this would be the absorbance feature and this would be how the peak would look like a small peak over here and a huge peak after that in the lower g value or higher magnetic field because it is g beta h whereas if the unpaired electron in the z square orbital i am going to see two values perpendicular value over here and the gz value over there and this gz or g par parallel value will be equal to 2.0023 and this should be the peak look like a higher signal over there and a low peak over there. Now, considering that, I am putting you 
a signal over there. Now, considering this, you can easily say where the unpaired electron is in the x square minus y square or z square. So this is how the normal, a typical copper ion looks like in EPR. And looking back to this over here, you can see it is more featuring like this. So we can say in typical copper ion, the unpaired electron stays in the x square minus y square orbital. That means what is actually happening? It is actually Z out Xantolar distortion happening in most of the copper ions. So that is how it is happening. And this peak splits in four because of the hyperfine splitting constant. Now over here, how the hyperfine splitting constant give you some idea about the geometry. So over here, I'm showing you the structure of a protein called azurine, which has a copper two center present in a protein. And this is the protein structure. If I look into the active site structure, a cysteine sulfur, two histidine, and a weakly bound methionine sulfur. And over here, what we found, the A value in the blue copper or this azurine protein is quite small, only 63 into 10 to the power minus 4 units, whereas in typical copper, it is 164 into 10 to the power minus 4 units, so almost double in typical copper than this. Why it is so? So can we use the A value also for difference and understanding? Let's take a look into that. And the other lingering question in our mind, why I can see the splitting in the G parallel or GZ value, but not for the G perpendicular or GXY value properly? The answer is lying in this way because this A value can also be anisotropic. That can be also dependent which axis you are rotating in and which orbital you are talking about. Why? Because this hyperfine splitting constant has three different contributions. What are the contributors? So hyperfine splitting constant talk about the interaction between the nuclear spin and electron spin. How many different ways it can happen? The first, the most simplest one, is that there's a direct interaction where the nuclear spin and the electron spin are actually interacting being in the same space. That means there is a finite possibility of the electron, unpaired electron is sharing where the nucleus is. The nucleus with compared to the actual orbital is quite small. I can consider this as a point. And that means the electron spin is considering uh, actually co interacting with that particular point. And that is going to give me this interaction known as Fermi contact interaction, where the unpaired electron motion, until electron distribution interacting with the nucleus. And that is isotropic in nature. That means there is no directionality involved in there because it is the electron density goes to this point where the nucleus is. No matter what, how the electron uh, how, coming from any particular orbital, it is going to be at the same place as the nucleus, which is a point. So there is no point of having a directionality. However, there is other possibility. There is a dipolar interaction. What is a dipolar interaction? That means a through space interaction between the nuclear spin and electron spin. Now, as I said, nucleus is kind of a point monopole if I consider in terms of the electron because electron density is huge with that nucleus is very small. So I can consider nuclear spin as a point, but the electron spin, no, I cannot take it as a point because it is staying in an orbital and this electron spin moment actually distributed along this orbital. And depending on that, whether it is a x square minus y square or z square, their distribution is not same. They don't look similar, not only in the shape, but also in the spatial distribution in which axis they are staying. And that is why this particular orientation or interactions, spin dipolar interaction, have a directionality factor and they can be anisotropic. And that is why the interaction with the d x square minus y square orbital in the z axis versus x y axis is different because we are not talking about the same thing. It depends on which particular direction I am coming through for this particular interaction with this electron and nucleus. So this is happening for the spin motion that can also happen for orbital motion. And we have already discussed how the orbital motion can be different depending on which particular axis it is orienting and which particular direction it is moving into. So that's why this orbital moment and the interaction with the nucleus will also be directionality dependent or anisotropic. And because this orbital dipolar moment, that means where we are considering the magnetic moment interaction between the nucleus and electron, where the electron moment is orbital in nature, 
and when the electrons moment is a spin in nature both of them will show a dehiscence factor and that is why they are showing this difference so that is happening in such a way that in the z axis they are having better interaction higher splitting in x axis and y axis lower interaction and low splitting but what happens in our original question why in the blue copper it is coming down what we can say from our understanding of the a anisotropy that over there the interaction is weak compared to a typical copper factor so how i can explain that before going to the explanation of that over there we can say that in this copper protein there is a sulfur present over there in the form of cysteine and that has a d orbital 3d orbital which can interact with the sorry 3p orbital which interact with the 3d orbital very strongly and moves a lot of electron density out of it creating a huge covalency that over there almost 42% of the bond is actually covalent for the copper whereas in a typical copper it is around 61% so this huge difference of 20 almost 20% covalency which shows that the electron is moving from the copper center to the sulfur now if the electron density moves out what happens if the electron density is moving out from the copper center the interaction between the copper nuclei and the electron spin will decrease and that is reflected with a lower value of a over here so this a value can be a very sensitive parameter which shows you even a very minute change in the interaction or the covalency or the distribution of the orbital all around the space now when will this g value a values will be active this a values you can say it is a dipolar interaction and to make sure this dipolar interaction present i cannot average it out that means we cannot orient the system at different directions very rapidly so that means in solution phase at room temperature where rapid tumbling occurs this dipolar interaction can cancels out because they can move in different orientations possible and disk and discrediting this interaction because it is direction oriented and you are orienting in all different directions within the time limit of the epr spectroscopy how can i do that if i can stop this motion how i can stop it if i take a solid system a crystal system i can stop it if i can freeze this sample at low temperature and that is why most of the time we are doing our epr spectroscopy at lower temperature so we can freeze the molecule and i can see all this dipolar interaction in a protein sample because the protein itself is not moving very fast and stopping the orientation of the unpaired electron present mostly in the metal that can be also very nice system to look into the dipolar interaction so that is why it is very clear over here a electron moving in a typical system with all different solvent molecules versus in a protein system you can see the difference is quite obvious with the a values so now last example of today so over here i am going to take a material because that has been asked by some of the questions over here if i can use some of the material system to explain with the epr so i took a material anatase which is nothing but a titanium oxide this titanium oxides are known for photocatalytic activity that means if i shine light on that it can create a charge separated hole and electron i can follow that by epr let's take a look so over here i take this uh, paper from this particular article and i take this particular figure which i go one by one so over here you can see this is a flat line when i take this epr in the dark where titanium oxide is present so there is no paramagnetic sample it is all diamagnetic no unpaired electron and that is what is expected when it is actually having a titanium oxide system then i shine light and we got this peak b this blue one you can see there is a peak over here and there is a sharp peak over here and a very broad peak over here why are those now go one by one this whole system the blue system can be splitted into three lines shown over here in the orange and this tail color first i am looking into these values this sharp g values which is written as g perpendicular 1.991 and g parallel 1.961 shown in this tail color so why this value this is nothing but a unpaired electron present in the titanium because do you, what happens when i 
actually excite the titanium oxide with H2O. It creates an electron and proton. The electron goes to a titanium center and creates titanium plus three. Titanium plus three is a D1 system, which is again very similar to copper system. And what it found in copper that the unpaired electron can be either in the XY plane or the Z axis, Z out or Z in system. And over there, if you remember all these values, it has a minus a particular integer two or eight and then a lambda divided by their energy difference. I'm just going back a little bit to give you what equation I'm talking about. So this equation I'm talking about. Sorry. So this particular equation I'm talking about over here and over here in the copper system, I said lambda is negative because it is more than half filled. But for titanium plus three, it has one unpaired electrons. It is less than half filled. At that time, delta uh, lambda value will be positive. So that means this negative term will stay and I will have G values lower than GE. That means unpaired electrons. And that is exactly what is happening when I am considering this titanium system over here. So this titanium system over here having values less than 2.0023 because it has an orbital motion contribution, but, but it is happening on as a different way that the G value is now lower than the free electron. And it shows that the unpaired electron is there binding with the titanium. Very nice. What is those two values? So this particular feature over here can be splitted in these two system, which is nothing but and oxidize oxide species because it also creates a hole during this splitting. And this hole is nothing but a species which can accept an electron. It accepts an electron from an oxide, creates this superoxide kind of species, which is staying over here. And it is showing this particular value. And you can see there are two different systems. What does it suggest? That means there are two different oxide species are there which can accept the hole. So it is giving you an idea of the molecular level, how the electron is splitting out. And over there, you see a hugely broad peak over there, which is again a titanium plus three, but it is randomly oriented. So that's why you cannot separate the G perpendicular G parallel value very well because it is not very well separated. It shows that this unpaired electron is on the surface, so it is moving in a very large area and canceling out any directionality. But in this system, the G perpendicular spiral, the sharp system, it is confined on a particular titanium center, and that is why they are quite localized and sharp signal. How to prove this is the hole? Then they actually provided isoproponent, which is known hole scavenger, and you created this particular signal. What happens? You can see this peak related to the superoxide is now gone. Only the sharp peak remains, and this peak over here becomes huge. Why? Because this hole is now consumed, but it creates some space of the electron come to the surface. So that's why it is this broad peak and the titanium, the localized titanium is still there, which is showing that it is actually still holding the unpaired electron on the metal center. So with respect to that, I am going to end my talk today, which is showing that the EPR spectroscopy can show you the result how the electron is behaving in a photocatalytic system, how we can follow a charge separation between electron and holes, where the holes are going, what it is actually happening. If there is one particular way or two different particular ways, we can follow that. Where the electron is going, it is localized or floating on the surface, we can define it. And over there, I want to mention that so far, all the systems I am considered is actually A is equal to half. That means one unpaired electron system, which is the simplest most system. There might be a lot of examples where you have more than one unpaired electron, and then the situation changes a lot. There should be zero switch splitting, there is grammar degeneracy, and which particular uh, transitions are allowed, all these different things come into play. But that requires more time, so possibly in a different talk, we can consider what happens when we have more than one unpaired electron. So with respect to that, I would like to conclude my talk over here. Hopefully I am in within in time and I'll be happy to answer a few questions if there are any. Thank you. Yes. 
Yeah, thank you, sir, for the question. Now, one more question uh, from that uh, while registration itself, one more thing has come. Is there any correlation between quenching of electron holes pairs versus ESR signal? Would you like to say something on that? Yes, so it is actually the quenching of electron pairs. So there are two different ways we can actually look into that. So sometimes mm -hmm. what happens is that we cannot see the overall spin, what we are seeing, especially for more than one unpaired electron cases, that we don't see the whole spin altogether. Why? Because there are different phenomena is also connected to that. One is known as a zero field splitting. So this spin state, for example, consider you have a five unpaired electrons. So over there, the spin state can go from minus up to minus five by two to plus five by two. And what happens? They actually paired up as plus five by two, minus five by two, one pair, plus three by two, minus three by two, one pair, minus up, plus up as one pair. And depending on the system, these systems are actually oriented in already different spaces, even before we apply the magnetic field, which is known as zero field splitting, because before we put the magnetic field, it already split it. And that's why most of the cases, the plus up and minus up is already, always in the lower uh, energy state. So we cannot even detect three by two and five by two. So that is why we lose some of the information over there. But if I go to lower temperature, we are able to see all those things. Now, other thing is that in a much more dynamic system, what happens that the unpaired electron is there, but due to some anti-ferromagnetic or ferromagnetic coupling, the overall spin can be different. And this system can also be exposed by this EPR ferromagnet, EPR spectroscopy, especially for the CIS spin system or spin crossover systems, where we can easily monitor how the overall EPS spectrum is changing with respect to temperature, because that is somehow connected to the overall molecular dynamics of the system, how the spins are interacting in between them. So that is what it is actually known as the spin quenching. And sometimes what happens, it can interact with the oxygen itself. Oxygen being a parametric sample, it can also interact with them. Yeah. Uh, okay, so there's, sir. Yeah, there's one more question comes regarding the uh, spinels. So uh -huh. the spinal uh, structure we can also look into in different ways. So for example, in EPR, if I want to take a look into it, if I know that the spinal has the structure of A, B, O2, where A is actually uh, one particular metal which stays in the tetrahedral and B is in the octahedral side. And over here, what happens? where the A atom is tetrahedral or octahedral. For example, say I having a system of a metal system where the tetrahedral orientation of the electrons is totally different from the octahedral and their number of unpaired electrons is totally different. So I am totally going to end up in two different systems. And going by EPR, I can find out which system is actually present in the material. It is a tetrahedral or octahedral by looking into the system. Because in EPR, I can easily find out what is the G value, which will be different for tetrahedral and octahedral, and the A value, which is also different for tetrahedral and octahedral. And by following that, yeah. I can easily find out. And if the overall number of electrons is different for octahedral and tetrahedral, it is much easier to say because the signals will be totally different. Yeah. And and there is one more question regarding the PN semiconductor junction. So it is very similar what I have explained with the anatase sample. So when we actually irradiate a semiconductor system, a photoactive semiconductor system, I'm going to create an electron and a hole. So both of them has an unpaired electron character. So now, depending on that, how the electron and the hole is situated in the system that I can find out. With respect to the anatase system, we can easily show from the electron side, I can have a very sharp signal or a very broad signal. Sharp signal say it is localized. That's why I can have the anisotropy, the directionality factor around it. But if it is moving towards a over a large surface area, I lost the directionality. I got a broad speed. So from the sharpness and the broadness of the peak, I can talk about that. And also the whole I can talk about which particular uh, nucleus it is sitting around. For an example, if it is oxygen, I can use the oxygen 17 isotope and oxygen 17 isotope has a spin of nuclear spin of I equal to half and I can see the splitting. And from there, I can actually say where my hole is actually situated. 
So by this, we can actually follow the semiconductor system with respect to the EPI. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Datta. Thank you. And if anybody has any other question, they can reach me via email. And yeah, they can be found good. in my website. Let me take this opportunity to thank my colleagues also, particularly from IT section and as well as my other colleagues. A lot of efforts have gone into it for conducting this uh, session. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.